All right, good evening, everyone. Um, we're gonna get started as some more people are kind of heading in here last minute. But um, just a friendly reminder, you're, you're muted upon entry and we're gonna share all relevant links and info for today's webinar in the Zoom chat. Um, I've got Megan from Desmos here to help me out and assist with that. Um, and you can pop any questions you have throughout um, in that chat as well, and she'll answer them as we go, or um, she'll be ready to relay those questions to me as well. Um, the bit.ly there that I posted and she's thrown into the chat has our agenda, um, as well as some resources that I will reference throughout and leave you with. So you'll have this presentation as well, the slide deck with those resources to go with it. All right, my contact information is there. It's also in that um, document that, that Bitly will take you to. Um, so any follow-up questions you guys have, um, feel free to reach out to me. Um, you know, I'm not here just for this hour to support you, but as things come up, feel free to reach out, follow me on Twitter, um, shoot some tweets out there. There's a great Twitter community out there. A lot of people um, involved with Desmos and sharing resources there. So just an overview of what we're gonna accomplish today. Um, we'll just do some brief intros and welcome, kind of get to know a little bit about me and mostly about Desmos, the company and their tools that are available. Um, we'll talk about Desmos specifically in Texas. So what is that looking like for your star testing um, and all the resources available to you there? Um, but really the majority of tonight, I want to spend sharing how to use Desmos and the calculator instructionally. So um, yes, it's going to be a tool that's available on your end of course test, um, but it's something where the real power comes is not in using Desmos to take a test, but in using the Desmos tools to learn and understand math. So that's really gonna be our focus tonight. Um, and then we'll give you a brief preview of Desmos Classroom, which includes lots of activities that you can find that are already pre-made as well as the opportunity to create your own custom activities. So um, not a lot of time there, but just kind of a brief little intro to maybe get you excited about exploring that a little bit more and see some of those resources um, in that bit.ly link that I shared um, to get you moving forward with those. We'll talk about next steps and then, of course, time for questions and answers at the end. Um, just a brief background on myself. So um, I've worked to become a Desmos certified presenter. Um, been doing that since 2017, but I am a full time classroom teacher. I'm currently teaching algebra two and geometry at the high school level. Um, I'm in Virginia teaching. So this presentation is going to be full of all kinds of great stuff that I've learned from the Desmos team. Um, about Desmos, um, but also just about math and about teaching math. And it's also going to include some of those experiences and, and seeing those things actually in action in the classroom. So um, uh, I'm excited to share a lot of what I've learned from Desmos, like I said, but also what does that actually look like in the classroom? Um, and what does that look like as far as also supporting teachers as they learn to use the tool? So Virginia's um, about one or two years just ahead as far as implementing Desmos in the end of course tests. Um, so I've been lucky enough to work with teachers all across Virginia as they've started to use Desmos with their students and see how it's gonna fit in their classroom um, as well as using it on the end of course test. So Desmos themselves, their company, just a little brief background of where they stand, their mission, their principles. Um, you know, they wanna help every student learn math and love learning math, I think that's something we can all get behind and get excited about. Um, and really what they stress is, is access. Um, so access to the power and beauty of math. Um, so these tools are designed um, to highlight that and allow students to experience that. Um, and that's, that's been really powerful in my classroom. Um, when we talk about access, that access shouldn't depend on their place of birth, race, ethnicity, gender, or any other aspect of their identity. Um, so one way that that accessibility is, is built in is everything you're gonna see tonight is free. Um, the, the graphing calculator tools, the other calculator tools, as well as the activities um, are currently free and will always be free. That is the Desmos promise. Um, they do have some curriculum um, that can be purchased as well as um, we're gonna look at the app that allows you to lock down screens for tests. Um, but the calculators and the activities that we're really gonna be focused on are, are free. Um, the other piece about accessibility is um, what's really been useful for a lot of my students is 
the Desmos calculator, you don't always have to be connected to the internet, right? Or you don't have to have a network connection. So once you download maybe the app for um, any device like a phone or an iPad, once that app is downloaded, you can use that without being connected to a network. Um, that also works similarly on a Chromebook. So if you open up the Desmos calculator from Chromebook um, while connected to a network, but then leave and are no longer connected, you can still use the calculator. Um, so I know that's been helpful. My students were lucky enough to be one-to-one -one with Chromebooks. Um, so there were times where they would keep that tab open when they left school and then wherever they were, whether they were, they had access to the internet or not, they were able to use it. Um, and it was interesting about that is I recently, I'm gonna show you this, I'm not gonna show the clip, but I'm gonna share the link to this testimony, uh, testimonial from actually a Texas educator. Um, and he talks about the success that his district has had in implementing Desmos. And one of the things he brought up was that he, kids started to do their homework more. And I hadn't really thought about that. That's been true with a lot of my kids too, where they've had the access to that calculator where they didn't necessarily have a handheld calculator um, at home. Um, so that's something that has um, been helpful with my students as well. Um, what Desmos believes, they honor student brilliance. Um, so what we're gonna see today is how can we use these tools to really highlight student thinking? Um, we wanna make student thinking the center of our instruction, right? We wanna use their ideas um, and build upon those ideas, um, kind of start with maybe some of their informal ideas and move them towards the more formal mathematics that we want them to use. Designing for delight, these tools can be fun. I wanna show you some of that fun tonight. And they wanna build for real classrooms and champion teachers. So I think one thing, the fact that I'm here as a classroom teacher presenting to you tonight, tonight um, kind of demonstrates that. Um, and also a lot of their features and tools um, come from ideas from teachers. Um, so they're, they're constantly listening to teachers and, and connected with real classrooms so that, you know, this isn't just another tech tool to use for the sake of technology, but it's actually useful to you, the teachers, and most importantly, the students as well. So basic overview of Desmos, we have the calculator tools, as well as Desmos Classroom, which we're, you can find those pre-made activities that I mentioned and custom activities. And we're really gonna focus on that graphing calculator tonight. But when you go to the homepage of Desmos, right, right in the middle, right here is that graphing calculator that we're gonna explore in a little bit. If you wanna see some of the other Calculator tools up here under math tools, you can see the scientific four function, matrix, test practice and geometry tool as well. And then when we get to the activities, you can browse activities and create activities by going here to this button. And then your students, once you've set up um, activities for them, this is one way they can access those. You'll have a class code you can give them and they'll enter that here and jump right into the activities. The main calculators um, that you'll see and students will use are those four functions, scientific and graphing. Um, and so I did notice in Texas, as well as the graphing calculators in the biology tests, students will have access to those four functions, scientific. So those, there's kind of a clear progression as far as the interface. So the more and more students are using those as they get to the high school level, they're gonna be very comfortable with that interface as they move up and progress. So specific to Texas, um, so Desmos calculators are available for STAR testing. So this year um, they are available, but they are not embedded for the digital STAR for this school year, 2021. Um, the hope would be that we can move towards embedding them into that digital STAR test, but um, currently they are not embedded. Um, so what you would make use of, or the students would make use of is what's called the district test mode. So this is an app um, that's gonna present the Desmos calculator that's configured specifically for Texas, which we'll talk about in just a second, how there are some slight differences um, to the Texas um, configured calculator versus the free um, Desmos calculator at desmos.com. And it's going to lock down that configuration for the student. So Chromebooks, iPads, Windows devices. Um, ideally or most suitable for a paper and pencil testing with a school managed device. So your student's gonna be taking paper and pencil tests. They would have a device next to them that would be locked down to just that calculator. They wouldn't be able to access anything else. Some Texas schools 
are making use of it alongside with the digital test. So what that most likely going to look like is two devices. So they're taking the test on one device, locked down on that, and then a second device where they would be locked down um, into the calculator. Your go-to um, for all information about Desmos and Texas is this link. It's in my presentation. It's in that bit.ly link that I shared in multiple spots. It's here on the first page, as well as the second page. Um, but this is really gonna be your go-to for all information um, about Desmos in Texas. And then also Megan's email is on here. If you want more information about specifically that district test mode, um, it's not too late to get it. So please reach out to her. When you go to this Desmos in Texas page, this is what it's going to look like. Um, so the first thing you've got is you can access the exact calculator that students have access to. So this is, you can see the green band at the top is gonna to be a little bit different than the desmos.com one. It says the star version, okay? so this. This link right here, you can have students go to to use the exact version um, that they will have access to on the STAR test. The differences you can find if you scroll down to the FAQs. And this PDF here gives a nice breakdown of what those differences are. So you can see what tests, what calculators are available for. And then you can see what is disabled on the Texas configuration. So for the most part, the advanced trig functions, right? We're not gonna really miss that for the students. The advanced stats functions, um, the list features, as well as images, folders, and notes. Um, those aren't gonna be a really big deal, but the sliders, the implicit plotting, the inequality plotting, you're gonna see those features tonight. I'm gonna to try to showcase those as how to use them instructionally, but they will not have access to them when they're taking the test. So I think that's important to make sure you're aware of that. Um, but I also wanna stress that just because it's not available for the kids to take the test, doesn't mean you should avoid using them in class. Um, so what I'm gonna demonstrate is they can be really, really powerful in the learning process. Um, and when you're introducing concepts um, for students to really see and understand the math um, on a deeper level. Um, but that's the PDF there where you wanna make sure you and your students both are clear on what will and will not be available on the test. All right, this is the testimonial I mentioned earlier. Um, so an educator in Texas, um, I think it's about three minutes. Um, he talks about implementing the Desmos calculators in his district and all the success that has come from it. So I highly recommend you check that out when you get a chance. All right, so again, any questions on those? Megan is available. We'll also have some time at the end um, for any questions specific to Texas uh, and Desmos. But what I really wanna get into, again, is the opportunity for you to experience Desmos as a powerful instructional tool. So what can this look like in your classroom um, as you start to implement it? So my goals are to show the basic tools, You know, how do you do graph and window settings as well as I, what I would consider the three main things you want to do with a graph and calculator. You wanna make calculations, you wanna maybe plot some points or explore tables and the numerical values, um, and then you wanna graph equations and functions. So we'll see that on display tonight. But that's not why you're here. That's not the point of using Desmos. Desmos is so much more than that. So some of what I call the next level advantages, it's really simple to use, it's intuitive. Um, so I've been using Desmos well before it was on our end of course testing. And I would have teachers say, well, why are you using that when students can't use it on a test? Um, well, not only is it a powerful tool for my kids to better understand the math, but I did not feel like I was teaching another tool to them. I didn't feel like I was spending a lot of time just teaching the calculator. Um, there's not a lot of button pushing. There's not a lot of menu navigation. So hopefully you'll see that on display tonight. Um, it's dynamic. Um, we're not gonna deal with just static graphs. We're gonna be able to animate. We're gonna be able to interact with our graphs and move things around. Um, I love the first time I heard this term mathematical sandbox was from Michael Fenton, one of um, the Desmos teaching faculty. He talked about just giving students these tools to just play and just 
in the process, connect representations. You're gonna see everything on one screen. You're gonna see the equation, the graph, um, the tables, the points, the coordinates. Um, and so they can just play around with these tools, these dynamic tools, and they start to connect those representations. Um, it's not the teacher telling them what those connections are. Um, and so through that process, you're having this rich classroom discourse. You're, you're talking about the mathematics, you're asking leading questions for the students to explore and make those connections on themselves. The last thing is it's great for feedback. Um, so feedback for students, so they can quickly put things in the calculator and, and, and get feedback from it that way. And it's not always the teacher that's providing that feedback. Um, and it's not just right or wrong feedback. It's, it's gonna be feedback that attaches meaning to student thinking. And I think that's really important and powerful. Uh, so it's not a simple, you're right, you're wrong, um, but it's almost gonna be kind of a mirror to their thinking. And that's what I would demonstrate to you tonight. Um, it's also gonna be an opportunity for feedback for the teacher. Um, and so when we get into the Desmos classroom and the activities, um, I'll show you how you can really get some insight into your student thinking and all your students um, in real time. So enough introduction, let's jump into some math, okay? So I'm just gonna demonstrate um, through a task some context of, of how you might implement Desmos in your instruction and what advantages might come from it. So um, here's a picture that I would throw up at the beginning of class maybe with my students and just start with that simple, what do you notice, what do you wonder, right? So very low, low floor, high ceiling kind of question. Just get everyone involved. Everyone can answer that question. Get kids talking about noticing the Twinkies, right? Maybe wondering how old those Twinkies are. Notice the remote. Wonder what they're watching on TV, right? Notice that this is apple juice. We can see the price. Notice there's a can missing, right? Maybe wonder why. Did you get thirsty waiting in line? Okay, so kind of get that conversation moving. Get some kids engaged without talking about mathematics yet. No notation, no fancy vocab. And then ultimately settle on the question of how much do those five cans cost? Okay, so maybe I don't want to buy all six. I want to buy just five. So I take one away. Probably not going to let me do that, right? But I say, come on, humor me. Let's come up with what the price would be for those five. So you have students work, maybe paper and pencil, with calculator, without, with Desmos, without. Um, but here's how we can use some of the Desmos tools to work through this problem and learn some math in the process. So we're gonna open up the graph and calculator. One thing I'm gonna do is since I'm projecting this into a presentation or if I was projecting this in front of my kids, I can make this a little more uh, bold, a little bigger, easier to read. So a lot of the graph settings in that wrench you can go to. And the first thing I'm gonna do is take that data that I have and graph it. So we know that Six cans are three dollars and twenty nine cents. So I want to plot a point six three twenty nine. So the first thing I love is that I did not have to navigate any fancy menus, go to any settings, push all these buttons. I want to plot a point. I go over here to my expression list. I plot that point. I can label that point. It's going to default to the coordinates, but I could label it anything I want. We can turn that label on and off. All right, so we need some more data. Before I go backwards to five, maybe I go forwards. So let's figure out how many 12 cans would be. Well, I would just need to take the 329, multiply it by two. I can add another point here. Let's go one more. So let's say 18 cans. Put a comma in between my points. And now I've got three points plotted. So another thing I like is I'm not navigating across screens. I did some calculations right here. Same screen that I'm entering in my points, same screen that I can see my graph. And I can edit that expression list and it will update in every keystroke my output, my answer there. I can convert quickly with this button to fraction, to decimal. We can talk about context, right? We're talking about money. So we're gonna keep decimal. That's gonna be the more useful form. 
And then over here, my window, I'm now outside my window of those points. So I can quickly zoom out and in with these buttons. If I get too far, I like this little home screen. It gets me back safely to where I started. And I can also click and drag. And it's just like I'm sliding a piece of paper. Again, really easy to navigate. And I'm not spending time teaching my kids how to, to correctly get the window. I can also, since this has context, we can really focus on the context of what these coordinates mean, right? Not focused on the button pushing, but focused on interpreting the mathematics here. So I can add in some labels for my x-axis. So in this case, we're talking about number of cans and my y-axis is the cost in dollars. Pops up right here. I can click on these points Ask my students, refresh my memory. What does this mean? What does this 12 mean? What does this 6.58 mean? Oh, 12 cans, $6.58. 18 cans, $9.87. All right, so we've got some data. We can see that they're lining up very nicely. So let's try to graph an equation. Y equals X. Just type in what I want to show up on the graph. It does immediately. Well, need change that slope. That's going the wrong direction. So let me try something else. 0 0.5, 0 0.6 is too much, 0.55. So I love that. I love that so much. This Every keystroke it's updating, I can see it instantly. The student can see instantly when I adjust something in the equation, what is happening to the graph. When we talk about connecting representations, it's really, really powerful opportunities for students. Okay, I've got points that I plotted on the same screen as the calculations that I did, as well as my equation there. Okay, love it. Question came up, how do you restrict the domain, right? So we could talk about even the context here, right? We're not gonna have negative cans. So maybe I just wanna keep this where X is greater than zero. So those little curly parentheses, we can put our inequality there it's going to restrict, we can restrict by X, we can restrict, restrict by Y. We could do a compound inequality as well. So lots of possibilities there for restrictions, very easy to get in there. And so again, I just started typing in my equation and playing around and experimenting with different slopes. So as I was putting in those values, I could see that that was too steep. So I went backwards to 0.5. I needed a little bit more, 0.6. I tried 0.55, pretty good. All right, so at this point, I'm gonna jump in to my question, right? So my question was how many for five cans? So I'm going to type in x equals five. And immediately I get that line that pops up. And this point even is highlighted a little bit. It's in gray, but that point of intersection and that x-intercept, those key points are already popping up. I'm not having to go through all this progression in my calculator and keystrokes to find that point of intersection. I want to know where they intersect, I click on it. So now I can see five cans should be $2.75. Maybe we move to one can. We can talk about unit rate. We can talk about direct variation. We can talk about slope. All kinds of now vocabulary that we can tie in as we move through um, our discussion of what we're seeing on the graph. All right, so again, a quick overview of what we've seen so far as far as the graphing calculator. We have looked at some of the graph settings. So I was able to quickly label my X and Y axis. I could set the X min and X max here as well. I can type in and change the step. But I can also quickly zoom in and out using the controls here. And I can click and drag and slide like a piece of paper as well back to my home screen. We plotted some points here. 
We did calculations, we graphed equations, and even threw in the restriction there. We got another equation and we quickly found that point of intersection. We could quickly find an x-intercept without a lot of navigating through the calculator. So a few other things with the points, you can also organize those in a table. So you can go to this plus sign and this is where we could add a table. And I could have entered in those points this way as well. I can hide these points that are up here and I can also just delete that line as well. So I can delete these one line at a time. I can also clear the whole calculator with this edit list button. So that will delete everything out. Another thing with the edit list button, so that's where I just deleted everything. I can also change colors and styles of points and lines here as well. I can make that point draggable. So now all of a sudden we can interact with our graph and this is only draggable up and down. So we have a couple options what we want. We can keep the label on and we can see how it's gonna update as I drag that point. I can change that line to be solid or dashed and change the color. And this will change that thickness as well. So that was all in the gear right here. The last thing in that gear that I'll point out is a lot of times we want to deal with the table and the numerical values for an equation or a function. And so this is where you can find the convert to table. So we can not only put that point into a table, but we could convert this equation to a table. And you can see those points are highlighted. I can hit enter and just continue, but I can also arrow down or click in that table and enter in different values for X that I'd like to see the Y values for. Nolan, do you have a moment for a few graphing calculator questions? Yeah, absolutely. So one is, how do you restrict the domain? Right, so right there was when I put in the curly parentheses here and then an inequality either with X or Y, that will restrict, you can restrict based on the domain or the range, right? And so we could even, change our function or equation. There's our restriction. We could do it with an inequality as well. So I could take that away. There's the entire quadratic inequality and there is the restricted one. Great, and one more question was, how did you get y equals 0.55x? So that was me just experimenting. So I just typed in literally y equals x. And then I kept adjusting the slope, just putting in different values. You can see as I'm changing the equation and based on what I saw the line do. And that's kind of getting at that feedback I was mentioning earlier where the students getting feedback kind of a mirror into their thinking. So they're seeing, okay, well, if I'm changing this value to two to three, well, that's making the line steeper. Well, if I put that 0.5, it's less steep. We could put it in as a fraction, right? One half, one third, one fourth, one fifth. So I was just literally typing in exactly what you saw and just playing and experimenting based on the feedback I was getting from the calculator. Great, and final one. When points are entered into a table, can they be labeled on the graph? 
So once we're in the table, and I love this too, there's some little shortcuts. I can type the word table and all of a sudden magic, the table appears. And I also got that table from that plus sign. So when we have the points in the table, I do not think you can label them. I do not know of a way to label those points in the table. You would have to have them in a separate line in your expression list. And I will add, if you notice when I have the table, this little magnifying glass pops up where it will zoom fit your window to those points. Great, thanks, Nolan. All right, awesome, great questions. Let's keep moving. So a few things you saw, right, like the inequalities, like that will not be enabled in the De uh, Texas version. Go back to that just to show. And you can see the little message here that tells that. Okay, but again, still a really powerful tool to use while you're instructing. I think the visual aspect of this, especially if maybe you're looking at um, systems of equations, inequalities, I should say, and you can see the overlap in the shading. You can also make use of function notation. It doesn't have to be y equals to graph. So we could graph circles, but that would be disabled in the Texas version again. So when they're taking the test, not able to use that, but still really powerful instructionally. So. I'm gonna take a few minutes to just talk about sliders and how I've used them instructionally. One other tool that's not available in the testing calculator, but this is really what sold me in using Desmond's. Um, this was years ago and I saw a professional development session and they put in Y equals MX plus B, just type that in. We've got, instead of numbers, we put in M and B and it's asking me if I wanna add a slider. So I immediately add those and I can press play. I mean, I can move them manually. I can go hands-free mode and just hit play and let it move. And to me, this was so powerful because it takes 10 seconds to create this dynamic graph that you can throw up in front of your students, ask that question, what do you notice? What do you wonder? Every kid can answer that question and every kid's gonna give you something about slope. Probably not anything formal, maybe some formal answers, not all, but they can see that line is moving. How is it moving? What's changing? Direction, steepness. You know, all of a sudden you're having this conversation with your kids about slope and moving them to, if they're not using that language already, moving them to that more formal language. Just asking them, what do you see? What's going on? What do you notice? What do you wonder? Right? Some kids might see it moving up and down. Some kids might see it moving left and right. So let's pause for a second. Remember, these points just show up really quickly so we can easily click on them, see the coordinates, and start to make some connections. Huh, well, that matches that. Let's get some more evidence of this and data. We starting to make a hypothesis. Let's see if it, it holds true. Huh, still matches. Still matches. So all of a sudden, the students are able to make that connection. Instead of coming into class and saying, all right, kids, we're going to learn about slope-intercept form. Here's what M is, here what, here's what B is. They can see it. They can see it themselves. So those circles that we were graphing. What's changing? What's not? What's changing? What's not? Come in here. They make those connections. Okay. 
So they can't use this when they're testing. All right, so again, an error message would come up. Doesn't recognize that M, too many variables, try defining M. I do like all the error messages too. They're helpful error message. You don't always get that in technology or handheld calculators, right? So I think their error messages are very helpful, whether it's in this version or the full version. All right, I think I saw a question about an image. I might just have something that works perfectly. So that's a well-timed question. Yes, thank you. Karina, thank you for that question. Look, I got a basketball. So how did I do that? That plus sign, you can add an image here. Happen to have it saved on my computer just for that question. You can move it around. You can resize it. I've actually had students do this. We were studying equations of circles. They had to find a circle, take a picture of a circle and then graph the circle, come up with the equation. So we could move this around. and try to match it up. Okay, so really powerful stuff, really easy to use. Love that we can add images in there. We can graph on top of it. Kids do art. They create all kinds of pictures using transformations, whether it's circles, whether it's functions. Um, and they're really applying that knowledge in a fun and interesting way. Um, and a lot of my students, it's amazing. Some of their art projects will have hundreds of lines of equations. And you just think like, there's no way I could give an, like a worksheet of a hundred equations that I wanted them to graph, right? Not gonna do that. And it's probably not even useful, but they are wanting to do it. They're excited about doing it because they're trying to create this, create something with the math that they're learning. So it's really powerful stuff. One other thing I really like about sliders is um, this actually came up a couple of weeks ago where I had several students within a problem in my algebra two class, something like this. And so some kids were telling me it's a to the fifth. Some kids were telling me it's a to the sixth. So I stopped them, said, look up here. Someone convinced me who's right, who's wrong, right? And so hopefully there's probably a conversation about well, a squared is a times a. And we're gonna multiply that by a cubed, is a times a times a. So there's a total of five a's, so it's this, right? But I also love then building off of that and just explaining it in another way where I can add this slider a. And now I can quickly change the value of a. So in the process, I'm quickly changing the value of the expression. So it's one more way for students to see, hey, when you write that a squared times a to the third is a to the sixth, you're not maintaining that equivalence. So there's a deeper conversation about equivalence now. There's a deeper conversation about what a variable is. A variable just represents some number, any number, right? Any number we wanna make it, the slider. You can even go beyond, you can see it's negative 10 to 10 click one of those numbers and I can say, I mean, we can go bigger. And so when we're rewriting these expressions, we need to maintain equivalence. Um, and that can be used for all kinds of things, right? We can, we can talk about combining like terms. Why does this equals this? It's another way to present it to students and to see. We can go all the way up to trig identities. Again, error message, let's see, use parentheses around the argument of sign. So again, really specific help here. Doesn't know if it wants the sign of A or the sign of everything after that. Doing trig identities, again, emphasizing when you're rewriting those trig identities, you're maintaining equivalence. So it's a quick way to deepen the kid's conceptual understanding of a lot of these procedures that they're memorizing. All 
All right, so what I want to do now is just take a minute to kind of give you a little sneak peek of Desmos activity. So you've gotten a, a good overview of the graphing calculator. So what I'd love for you to do is gain a student perspective of an activity first before I jump in and show you um, my perspective as a teacher. So you're going to head to student.desmos.com and you're going to enter in that class code. So this is one way you can get students into the activity. I'm also going to throw in the chat a direct link. If you click on that, the code will already be entered for you. So um, for my students, um, I'll have them click on that link. I'll post it for them and it will already just give them one less step for them to maybe mess up, but it will enter in that class code for them. And you're going to be taken into that activity. Um, you can sign in if you have an account or you can continue without signing in. And once you get into the activity, there's just gonna be a couple screens. You're only gonna be able to navigate the first two, but I'd love you to just answer a couple of those questions based on what you've seen so far. So is there anything you saw that you're excited to start implementing as far as the graphing calculator? So again, you're experiencing the student and the student perspective where we've, I've created this as a custom activity. Um, I created these slides, um, came up with the questions. And one of the things I love is that a lot of the multiple choice is going to allow or, or prompt students to explain their answer. So again, when we talk about getting insight into student thinking, we're able to not just see their answer to a multiple choice question, but we're able to see them have to explain their answer. So as you're jumping in, I'm gonna be able to see who's in there. I'm gonna be able to see as well, the responses in real time. So again, as you're working, I'm gonna be on the teacher dashboard. It's gonna be back on my screen. Um, feel free to go through those questions. And as you are, I'm gonna be starting to collect some responses. And one thing I'll point out is how closely tied the, the teacher dashboard is to the five practices. Um, and so right now I'm gonna be monitoring the responses, I'm gonna start selecting responses that I wanna use and sequence those as well as you're going through. All of this is happening in real time. So um, I would say the Desmos activities have been the most powerful tool for me as far as formative assessments go. Um, it truly does allow me to engage every student and get insight into this, the thinking of all my students and then use their thinking in my instruction. I think that's really the most powerful piece of it. Okay, so as you finish up those questions, come back and just take a look at my screen for that teacher dashboard. And you've been paced to just two screens. So that's something I can do from the teacher dashboard. Um, I could let you roam free the entire activity. This, this activity has nine screens on it. Um, I could actually pace you one screen at a time. We could literally go screen by screen together as a class, or like I have now, we can do a range of screens that you can navigate in between. So um, that's part of what's called the classroom conversation tools. Um, so I have that pacing. Um, I could also pause you at any point. So as you're wrapping up, um, I might give it a little pause. So I apologize to those of you in the middle of your sentence, right? We're probably gonna give that warning. 
but then that would be the kind of signal, hey, I need you to looking at my screen, okay? Um, I need everyone back and looking up here. The last tool in the, the classroom conversations tool in this dashboard that you'll see on my screen is the anonymize button. So as you all have logged in, your names are showing up here. And in my summary view, I'm able to see what screen you're on and what screen you're interacting with. Um, this is also if there's correct or incorrect answers, you could see some checks or X's based on responses. And when I hit anonymize, it changes those names to famous mathematicians. Um, so I mentioned how while you guys are working, I'm starting to collect student responses that I want to share and project and use in our instruction. And so if I put it in anonymous mode and I share someone's response, all of a sudden I don't, we don't have to worry about whose response that is or who's right, who's wrong. We feel embarrassed, right? We can focus on the math. We can focus on well, what we want to learn from that response. So the anonymous mode is really awesome for sharing that work, creating that safe environment where your students are going to feel free to put their ideas out there. Also, while you were working, if I go into the teacher tab here, the teacher view, each screen, in this case, since it was a multiple choice question, I get the quick overview of who responded where. Right, so that gives me a quick overview in real time. And then I can scroll and read the different responses. And this little camera icon here is a snapshot tool. So what that does is it takes everything to the snapshot view. Okay, so so far we've had the summary view, just an overview of where everyone is, all the screens. The teacher view gives me the individual responses and organizes them for me. And as I collect snapshots, I can start to put them in slides and order them how I want to go over them. All right, so everyone's working. I'm getting my responses ready. I pause the activity. We come back and we discuss some things that we've enjoyed so far. All right, so connecting representation is a big response for a lot of us. Okay, some things they struggle with and being able to see it visually. I think that graphical representation is really helpful. Creating dynamic visuals, absolutely. Like students to be wowed and excited to learn. Absolutely, you see those things animated and moving around, that can be exciting, right? Putting images up, creating art, that's exciting for the students. Some of the questions you guys still had, how often do we have students pull up Desmos calculators while you're in class? Well, that question has changed quite a bit in the past year. Um, you know, I think it's one of those things when I first started using it, it wasn't necessarily every day, um, but right now I'm, Currently, we have moved back in Virginia in my district to, I guess, what they're calling concurrent teaching now, where I have some students in person, some students at home. So I'm making use of Desmos activities every day. Um, it has been a way to really connect with students and make sure, um, you know, I'm getting access into their, their thinking and what they're doing. So um, definitely has adapted and changed in the last year a lot, um, but it's, it's every day at this point. And the calculators themselves, um, I would also say we're, we're, it would be close to daily even before this, where a lot of times we want that graphical representation, either to introduce the topic, and that's kind of a progression a lot of times I'll go through is we'll, we'll introduce a topic with the graphing calculator, <clears throat> maybe take it away a little bit so they can practice and understand it, and then bring it back to maybe get some feedback and check their answers. So one example of that that I didn't use, but just to illustrate is function notation. So if I was introducing this topic, I'm gonna to bring the technology in and let kids explore and just think about, well, what does this mean? And so by, by being able to just change this number quickly and then see the result change immediately, hopefully students start to see a connection. Well, this is my X, this is my Y. We may not say that right away, right? But we can lead them there a little bit. Input, output, we start using that formal language. And then we can easily connect it to the graph. So 
So now I'm talking about this topic of function notation, introducing it, letting students explore, okay, what's the calculator doing? And like, I asked them, figure out what's the calculator doing? Once we figure it out, okay, then they're gonna do some problems without the calculator, but then come back to it, let them check their work, right? Let them say, instead of me just giving them an answer key, okay, set it up. Did you calculate it correctly? Did you find f of five correctly? Okay, so that would be one way, again, where I'm using the calculator quite a bit with my students. Computational error, making activities. Yeah, so today we are not unfortunately gonna have a time for that, but I will push out some resources to you all as we wrap up here um, and, and hopefully point you in the right direction as far as that. And, and hopefully a future webinar can um, help out with that. I also point you to currently um, Desmos is doing Desmos Live, which has been, I think every Thursday, um, so there are, those are recorded as well. And there's a lot of work with the computation layer that's there, as well as if you go to the Desmos YouTube page, um, there's lots of videos and past webinars that are posted and available to you for that too. All right, but what I wanna do is just give you a little bit more time. I'm gonna stop the pause and the pacing, allow you to explore the next few screens and then come back um, and just kind of wrap up with the activities and open up to more questions. Um, so I know Megan threw into the chat some stuff about the Desmos computation layer documentation. That page has just been updated. It's very user-friendly. I have found it a lot more helpful with those updates um, to navigate and really understand some of those um, coding. And um, a copy of this presentation will be in the resources that I will share, which has been shared in the bit.ly as well. Megan's throwing in, she's on top of this, the Desmos YouTube channel has past Desmos live recordings, old webinars. So there's lots of good stuff there for those that are thirsty for more, especially with the programming and the building activities. So I gave you a couple screens with Shear the Sheep, so you can keep exploring with, you can come back and look at my screen, but I just love this activity. This is a newer activity. And I think it just demonstrates so much goodness that, that Desmos tries to put into their activities, um, especially in the terms of feedback, right? So when you're exploring with this, there's not a lot of direction, right? It's just kind of like, hey, shear the sheep, loves eating grass, doesn't like water, see what happens, right? So. All right, kids got to explore. Something's already in there. Let's just try that. And there's feedback. Not necessarily right or wrong, right? There is a reaction. We can see, hey, that's probably not great for Shira, right? Shira's not too happy. So we can continue to try different things. And then we can see what happens. So that feedback is giving students insight into their own thinking. Right, it's, it's re I think of it again as a mirror. It's like they're able to see and step back. Okay, this is what I actually created. And they can play around with it. And then you can kind of pause, come back as a class and have a discussion. And then, whoa, I love that. I love that, look at that. X less than 10 and that little blade of grass is still there. So we can have a discussion, how do we get that blade of grass? How does Shira get that one piece of grass? We need the or equal to. And so this little keyboard brings the on-screen keypad and a lot of these symbols that you might use. But I also love a lot of these shortcuts where you have the less than symbol. If I just type the equal sign after it, it puts it together for me. Now Shira gets all that grass and Shira is happy. Like what awesome context to really talk about including and not including. Like what a great anchor to come back to five months later where you can say, you remember Shira, right? Remember how we needed that, that grass, right? Or you're looking at a student response and saying, you left the blade of grass there. Should we have left that blade of grass, right? So you've got that context 
come back to when you're doing those more abstract problems. Um, so really, really cool stuff in this activity. There's a lot of things like this where we're developing the concept or we're practicing it um, in fun and engaging ways for students. The other one that's in here are the marble slides. There are lots of these for different functions. You can create your own, but it's a great way to make those connections between the algebraic and the graphical representations, right? So we can quickly see what we need to change, what we don't need to change. And so the goal is to get this line to get all those stars. We hit launch, success, kids are feeling good. I will say I've done marble slides and this is the most successful activity I would say I've used as far as engagement. I literally had a teacher next door come over and ask us to quiet down because when kids were getting these, they were yelling and clapping and getting excited for each other. There's some really challenging ones that are out there as well as ones you can create. So um, highly recommend. Absolutely not. You can use, there's all kinds of pre-made ones at teacher.desmos.com. Great segue. I will jump on that because I know I'm running out of time. So when you go to teacher.desmos.com, you can search activities by topic, but you can also search like I want to see marble slides. And so you can see a lot of the ones that are pre-made there as well. We've got parabolas, exponentials, periodics, and so on. Not 100% sure there's this one specific to polynomials, but you can also create your own. So um, there is a custom button here where you can create your own activity. And I'm going to segue that right into the resource page that I've left you with. Okay, so questions about the presentation. Here is the link to the presentation. Here is my email. Again, here's the, a link to the Desmos in Texas page. It's also on the second page. Um, your go-to to get started, I would say, is the learn.desmos.com. I will also say, I put the user guide here because I know a lot of teachers that have printed this out. They like to have this handy, just that hard copy and a quick reference. You can see some of the things you've seen tonight that maybe were a little quick. If you're just beginning, you can come back to and really look at how did we do that? What are the different functions we can use that maybe you didn't see? Um, but the user guide I found is really helpful when you're first just getting started. And the learn.desmos.com, here's where, you know, you can go specifically to activities. Um, so getting started with activities, that's where I would go to get started, right? And there's all kinds of good stuff when you explore this page. An overview of everything. How do you find an activity? How do you assign an activity, right? So how did I get that class code to give to you guys? A couple different ways to set that up. And then you can head to the yeah, classroom activity. So again, tips for getting started, videos, next steps, all kinds of good stuff here for you as you're exploring and learning more and jumping into the activities. Um, I don't think I have this thing I'm gonna add it in, but they just recently updated their guide to building great, in parentheses, digital math activities. Um, and I emphasize the, the idea of feedback, but this has been huge for me as far as not just how I use Desmos, but really anything in my classroom. There's a lot of good stuff of what they reflect on and what they're focused on when they're creating these activities. And feedback is definitely a big piece of that. Um, I talked about the five practices as well. Um, I think the, the teacher dashboard just fits so perfectly with that. Um, you know, you're planning, you're anticipating, but then during the lesson you're monitoring on that dashboard, all your responses, you're able with those snapshots to select and sequence those responses. So it's student thinking that you're talking about, you're displaying, right? There's a little more buy-in with the student when all of a sudden, oh, that's my response you're talking about. Oh, it wasn't right, but I'm still highlighting some interesting things about it, right? I'm still validating their thinking and their ideas um, in my classroom. So it's really powerful stuff there. And I'm helping them connect ideas as we go. 
So you saw the Desmond's classroom, student perspective, teacher perspective. Hopefully you're excited about that. You got your resources. There is a short survey there. We'll uh, imagine Megan's on top of it. She'll throw it into the chat as well, but that's the bit.ly for the survey for the webinar. So we'd appreciate, I think it's only three questions. If you could give us some feedback, but I'm gonna check in with Megan, see if there's any questions that have already been asked or any more that you guys want to know about. All right, but I'm, I'm really thankful you guys shared this time with us tonight. Um, and hopefully you saw some things that you're excited to start using. Nolan, one of the only questions that emerged in the last few minutes was uh, whether you know of any marble slide activity about polynomials. I don't know if there is one, but maybe we could do a quick check. Yeah, I'm not aware of one. I know when I just did the general search, it did not come up. But I will say that didn't come up. There are these featured collections that I didn't mention. Um, so this is more by topics as well, um, but it doesn't look like there's one specific to polynomials. There's a functions one. So yeah, I don't think there is one specific to polynomials, but it is possible to make one yourself. Um, so you kind of get to set up where the stars are. Um, so depending on how you would want to look. Um, it does take a little more time, right? And when you're getting started, I definitely recommend using what's out there, but um, you could create your own custom one. And I think that's what you would have to do for that one. You could also challenge your students. Um, you could use like the linear one, but you could ask them to use polynomial equations or you could use the quadratic one and ask them or even adapt that one. You could, you could copy and edit that activity to, to maybe fit the polynomials. No, and I think those were all the questions for for this evening. I haven't seen anything come through okay. in the in the Q and A, but you had posted your contact information. Um, I'm Megan at Desmos.com. Pretty easy, except my name is a little bit funky, has a lot of vowels, but um, we are quite accessible. Yep. So surveys there, and like I said, all the resources are in that bit.ly as well as my contact information and that tech, uh, Desmos in Texas page is gonna be your go-to, which is also where this webinar will be posted um, once it is polished up and ready to go. Actually, there was another question that just came in. Okay. Um, Karina asked, if I create an activity with sliders and share it with students, can I hide the input part of the graph? So you can, I guess a couple things with that, you can hide specific lines in the input or you could have the input completely gone, but then they would not be able to necessarily control the sliders. I guess if that makes sense. Does that answer, Karina, your question? So I can pull it up. So this is where we're building and there's different components here. So I can add the full screen graph. So when I add the full screen graph, that's going, when I hit preview, students will have access to this. If you want them to have access, but maybe not to something else, like maybe you want them to match another line. You can create a folder. And then I could hide that. 
So there could be some things they see and then some things they don't. Super helpful. Yes, Karina just followed up with, I saw some activities where students can manipulate what's on the graph, but don't have access to the input part. So I think depending without seeing it, let's see if this works. So yeah, if I don't do a full screen graph, I'm just adding the component, the graph component here. So I can edit the graph here and then the student can still interact with it, um, that dynamic piece without access to that. Terrific, yeah. she said that's it, awesome. <laughs> what you were just showing. Thanks, Karina. Any final questions from folks who are still tuned in? Stephanie, thank you for asking the question about um, will we be able to get an hour PD for this session? Um, I don't totally know. It might be up to your district, but I'd be happy to send you the recording once it's available so you could see if you get permission from your, your district. We're not a, a PD granting or credit granting entity, but happy to provide documentation or helpful links for you if you're pursuing that from your, your local district or school. Great. And Karina, thanks for asking, are we having these sessions regularly? This is our, I believe it might be our first Texas specific webinar. Um, if, if there's growing demand, we could see about doing more. But as Nolan said, we have these weekly Desmos Live events, or I, I take that back, there might not be one tonight, but they're mostly weekly on YouTube Live with folks from Desmos that get on and, and play around with really fun graphing techniques, computation layer techniques. So that's worth checking out. And we also keep a webinar schedule up to date on our learn.desmos.com page. So be sure to check that out for more opportunities to tune into other webinars that will be, will be running. And yes, Kathleen, happy to send a copy of the Google form response, certainly. And Elaine can can do. Thanks for, for asking that question. Karina, are you talking about the activity? Yes, so I will send you, this is my edited one. Um, I'll throw it in the chat, but I pulled that, you can just search for Shear the Sheep too, if you want that exact activity. I think I linked to it as well in the activity, but let me throw that in here. So that will take you to my edited one where I just copy and pasted those screens from that activity. Awesome, and I will put that also in the document. Great. Um, well, I'll, I'll say my final words, then Nolan, I'll hand it off uh, to you to close. Uh, but thank you all for joining. We're really thrilled at Desmos about um, 
growing interest in our work within Texas and really here to support you all in, in sharpening your skills um, so that you can help spread Desmos to your students and use it in your instruction. Um, we will be posting a recording of this webinar to the learn.desmos.com page, Desmos in Texas. So if you have any um, desire to go back and reference what we talked through today, that will be available there. Yeah, just thanks again for joining. Um, again, hopefully you are excited to get moving forward wherever you are in your journey of implementing Desmos. Um, but feel free to reach out again with my contact information there as questions come up um, as you're exploring exploring more 